there. Thanks for listening to Let's Talk Withdrawal, a weekly discussion on antidepressants and the issues surrounding them. Hello and welcome to episode 6 of Let's Talk Withdrawal, a new weekly podcast discussing antidepressants. Before we get started, I just wanted to thank you for getting in touch and sharing your feedback, and we'll be going through some of the feedback later on. But first, I'm honoured to have had the chance to interview Dr. Terry Lynch. Dr. Lynch has consistently called for a reappraisal of how human suffering and distress is interpreted and responded to within modern Western societies. Ten years into his career as a GP, he lost faith in the medical approach to emotional and mental suffering. He went on to write Beyond Prozac, Healing Mental Distress, a bestseller in Ireland in 2001 and shortlisted for the Mind 2002 Book of the Year Award. He trained as a psychotherapist and for the past ten years he has provided a very different kind of mental health care. His latest book is Depression Delusion, The Myth of the Brain Chemical Imbalance. I was keen to talk to Dr. Lynch about some of the common psychiatry myths, his books and courses on depression, and his views on antidepressant prescribing. Thank you for talking to us, Dr. Lynch. Firstly, for the listeners, could you give us a bit about your background and how you came to view modern medical practice? Uh, Sure, James. I'm very happy to be talking with you today. I qualified as a medical doctor in 1982. Uh, I worked in hospitals for a few years, and then I did what I think most GPs in in England would do as well, and Britain would do, which is I embarked on a GP vocational training scheme that lasted for three years. And then I set up as a general practitioner, GP, and worked as a GP for about 10 years. I was a very enthusiastic doctor, a very enthusiastic GP. I really believed in what I was doing and believed in the correctness of what I was doing and loved the work. So that was how I started. Then I suppose as time progressed, And the more I listened to people and listened to people's stories, I began to become uncomfortable with the fact that what I was hearing from people, particularly in relation to to emotional and mental health, didn't quite fit with what I had been taught. Mm. In fact, a lot of it didn't fit with it at all. What I was hearing from people was pain, distress, overwhelm, uh, woundings of life, really. But what I had been trained into was to see all of this, to, to categorize all of this as illness and disease. And I became progressively more uncomfortable with that. And I began to ask questions and more questions. And the more questions I asked, few answers came up, but more questions came up. And so one thing led to another. But that's where it started, James. Thank you. And I I just wondered, was it that experience that led to your first book, Beyond Prozac, Healing Mental Distress in 2001? Because that's one of the first books that I noticed that started to deal with the issue of, are we asking the right questions of our patients? Yeah, very much, James. It was a natural progression, really. I see the medical approach to mental health now as a belief system. It's an ideology. And I was a complete convert. I really believed in what I had been trained in or taught to believe in. But then that began to just get chipped away. And I would go home sometimes really struck by something I had heard and feeling uncomfortable about my my skill even, my my ability to to tune into what I was hearing because I wasn't really trained as a psychotherapist. I was trained as a doctor. So one thing led to another. I started taking notes as in I would note something that seemed interesting and I should come back to or important. And one thing led to another, led to another, led to another. And before I knew it, I had the material for Beyond Prozac, yes. And Beyond Prozac was very much questioning, questioning the current status quo, but also providing concrete evidence from people's stories that there's far more to this than looking at emotional and mental distress through the eyes of disease. That we're on the wrong track. We were on the wrong track then, and we're still on the wrong track. I'd certainly recommend that listeners read the book for its excellent analysis of modern psychiatry. And it's saddening that many of the issues that you identified over 15 years ago are still in place today. I just wanted to ask you, in the many interviews that I've done for this podcast, I have been struck by how often interviewees have been telling me that doctors are justifying the use of psychoactive prescription medications by quoting the chemical imbalance theory of depression. I'm aware that this has come to be regarded as a myth, and I've heard you be very clear about that. I just wondered if you could expand on some of the myths of modern psychiatry for us. I I suppose for me in in Beyond Prozac, the whole chemical imbalance idea was the first myth that I began to unravel because that was the one I was most familiar with. It was the one that was most mentioned. And what I've come to learn in the 15 years between writing Beyond Prozac and now 
is that we have a really serious global problem in mental health. And I hesitate to word use to use the word sinister, but there are aspects of this that certainly are not in the public interest. They're in the interest of various groups involved in, in, in this. But the chemical imbalance, that is a complete myth. There never, never was any evidence that it was true. And it was publicized vociferously and enthusiastically by the drug companies and by the medical profession. And it was pushed and pushed and pushed. And yet there was never, it was never established. And over the years, I've put an awful lot of thought into this. And the title of my last book in 2015 was The uh, Depression Delusion, The Myth of the Brain Chemical Imbalance. And I use the term delusion there because it is a delusionary idea. It's never been proven to be fact. Now, the next question, I'll come, back, I'll come to the issue you mentioned about other myths in a minute. But the question arises, if this is not true, why do doctors say it? Why have doctors for 30 years, 40 years been articulating this either as a truth or so close to being a truth that it makes no difference? Why do doctors still, and you're completely correct in what you say, I, I get that experience myself with people I meet who are repeatedly told in 2017 that they have a brain chemical imbalance and that the medication will correct that. I do think the word sinister has a place here because it's, it's fundamental misinformation. And I feel that now, I think a lot of doctors don't realize maybe that this is what why they're really doing it. But the whole purpose of this untruth is to channel emotional pain and distress that doctors say is consistent with depression, and I'll come back to that later on, that that is now a medical problem. So it, it channels that whole major world of human experience into the medical profession. The medical profession then own that. So it's about territory, uh, as I think it was Phil Hickey, a great... Psych, a psychologist who writes in Madden America quite a lot described it as as an issue of turf wars, really. So it it gives the medical profession plus the drug companies, if you like, possession or expertise, particular expertise in, and it legitimizes prescribing because the person leaves the room thinking, oh well, the doctor said I have a chemical imbalance and this drug will will correct my chemical imbalance. But it is fundamentally wrong and it's misinformation and it should not happen and it's very serious. I agree, and it's worrying, as is the other myth which is often given, which is that an antidepressant is like insulin for a diabetic and therefore needs to be taken for life. Scientifically, the two could not be further apart. Again, it is wrong, it is misinformation for doctors to say, well, it's just like diabetes. And to give you one simple, stark example of why they are so different and should never be used in the same sentence, is that no person in Britain or Ireland or anywhere else in a modern developed medical system, no person is diagnosed with diabetes without having raised blood sugars. It's just an absolute basic fact. And any doctor who diagnoses diabetes without the chemical imbalances will find themselves in court, will find themselves in front of the medical council for malpractice. And yet it's precisely the opposite picture with depression and the other psychiatric diagnoses. They're claimed to be just like diabetes, they're claimed to be chemical imbalances, yet no human being diagnosed with these conditions anywhere has ever had their chemical imbalance, which is where the comparison with diabetes comes in, confirmed. And nobody who's on treatment for depression or any other psychiatric diagnosis for 20 or 30 years even has ever had a test done to confirm a biological abnormality similar to that that occurs in, in diabetes. Another major difference between depression and diabetes is that once you're diagnosed with diabetes and you're put on insulin or other treatment, you don't recover. Recovery is not even a possibility. You're on medication for the rest of your life. And it is a fact that many people diagnosed with depression do recover, do come off their medication. So what happened to their chemical imbalance? Did it disappear? Did it cure itself? What happened? The very fact that there's such a difference there in terms of recovery from diabetes, where recovery is known to be not a possibility, it's complete management. And people accept that because they understand that they have a chemical imbalance that isn't going to heal itself, that needs daily treatment. Whereas with depression, many people do manage to come off their medication and the chemical imbalance that they were told they had is somehow disappeared. So that's another major difference between diabetes and depression. And to extend that somewhat, you take bipolar disorder, another condition that is often equated with diabetes. I personally know over two dozen people who have made very good recoveries, full recoveries from bipolar disorder. And again, as I said, no one recovers from diabetes. So how can people recover from bipolar disorder 
if it's a chemical imbalance that they have for life. So again, we have to reframe how we see these experiences and behaviors. So again, it's the same ultimate reason, in my opinion, and it is to channel this whole area of human experience into medical possession, really, and telling people these untruths, that if there are chemical imbalances, there are illnesses like diabetes, that convinces people that, oh yes, the doctors really know that it's medical, but they don't know, and they're misinforming people. Another one, to come back to some of the other ones you mentioned, another of the common myths is that depression and other psychiatric diagnoses are brain disorders. Again, that is completely unproven. In these two courses I mentioned, I've gone through very extensive lists of, of brain disorders created by highly respected organizations, neurological organizations. And depression is not mentioned on any of these. Bipolar disorder and other psychiatric diagnoses, they're not mentioned on any of these. For something to be a brain disorder medically, it has to fit certain criteria. It has to be establishable as a brain disorder through tests or, or pathology on post-mortem examination like happens with Alzheimer's, for example, none of, that none of that applies to depression or bipolar. So we have a really serious misinformation problem globally on mental health. And one of the areas we really need to look at again is this massive trust we have placed in the medical profession to solve these problems. Because if they're not fundamentally medical problems, then we need to be asking, are the medical people the right people for this job? Can I just read you something? Um, as I was thinking about our talk, our conversation today, I, I was reminded of <clears throat> Beyond Prozac. My first edition was published in 2001. That's 16, 17 years ago now. And the, the Irish edition was, was the, the foreword was written by a psychologist called Tony Humphreys. And his first line in that, in that foreword stopped me in my tracks when I read it. And I'd, I'd like to read it to you. He wrote, it was an unfortunate event in history that individuals who were psychosocially distressed ever came under the umbrella of the medical profession. That's a pretty striking statement. And I'm not suggesting that medication has no place. Of course it has a place. And anybody listening to this who would say that medication has helped them or saved lives, I completely agree with, with that. This is not black and white. We need to be honest about this. And we need to get away from delusionary ideas that the, the drugs help by correcting chemical imbalances that have not even been established to exist. They help all right sometimes. Why? Because they change how people feel. If if somebody's very anxious, for example, and they take something that calms them somewhat, well, of course they're going to feel bad. So I'm saying this should be about informed consent. People are entitled to medication, of course, but with proper informed consent about the medication, what it does, what the adverse effects are, etc. Then I'm completely okay with it. Well, Dr. Lynch, what you say does resonate with me because it wasn't until recently that I realised I had no physical diagnostic test that confirmed that I needed an antidepressant. I filled in a form which by its very nature encouraged me to think about the negative aspects of my life and based upon a score in a box, I was put onto psychiatric medication. Now, doctors might say that that was a diagnostic test. Quite often, uh, various questionnaires are used, but of course they're not used in any other. You won't have um, heart disease diagnosed by a questionnaire or a brain tumor diagnosed with a questionnaire, you'll have tests done to confirm it. But this comes back to other myths that you, you asked me about. But here's a myth. The general public assume that doctors are fully objective about all, all of this and their, that their commitment to people's well-being is total and complete. And I've learned over the years that that's not true. First of all, doctors are very invested in the biological focus on emotional and mental health. They are very invested in that. And like any group of humans who have invested a great deal of who they are and what they do in something, I think I've seen this. Doctors really struggle to contemplate that actually there might be a lot more to it than that. Now, in terms of then their commitment to people, this is a really important point. Are doctors who deal in mental health committed to people's well-being? Yes, but not totally. It's conditional. And the condition that is placed on this, most doctors may not even have thought this through, but I've seen it a thousand times. The condition is we are totally committed to people's emotional and mental health and well-being so long as all of the work and the beliefs happen through our ideology. So as long as our ideology is a system through which this all works, then you have our full commitment. But by definition, that's not a full commitment because it doesn't factor in other really important aspects, such as the emotional and psychological aspects of what we call depression and bipolar disorder. These don't get a fraction of the attention that they that they deserve. And another area where this comes up, and I, I mentioned it in an email to you, James, you know, why is it that we have so few psychiatric drug withdrawal centers. You take benzodiazepines, which, what, 30, 40 years ago now, it, it was eventually admitted by the medical profession that there were big problems with them. And yet 
there are not that many centres, official centres, for withdrawal of these drugs. And then with the SSRIs, which I wrote in Beyond Prozac 16 years ago, clearly caused dependency. The evidence is there. Very, very hard for people to actually find organised systems where they can withdraw from these drugs. And again, that's to do with what I said earlier on, that because anything that may reflect badly on the ideology will not be embraced by the system. and Therefore, the system is not objective. I agree. And again, in my own experience, not only can I not find any treatment centres to help me withdraw, I've really struggled to find any doctors or psychiatrists who will even admit that withdrawal is a possibility or that it's not just a short-lived temporary phenomenon that only happens to a small proportion of patients. That's certainly not my experience or the experience of many people I have interviewed. Yes. And this is this is something that the public really need to get again. The reason that doctors, and as I said, I am a doctor. I've been a doctor for 34 years. So I observe my colleagues very closely. And I have come to the conclusion that the reasons doctors struggle so much with this and, and say the kind of things you've just said is that they have invested so much of who they are and of their time and of their life in a particular viewpoint, in a particular understanding and ideology. And to think that that could be wrong or that some of what they might be doing could be more, a lot more harmful than they realize jars them. It, kind of, it creates a cognitive dissonance. It's an appalling vista. And we've seen down through the years how reluctant invested groups are at looking the appa- at the appalling vistas that they have been involved in creating. I, I realized 17 years ago that drugs like Siroxet and Prozac caused withdrawal reactions. How did I, rea- how did I realize that? Just by listening by actually listening to the people who came in my door. And I began, I suppose, to prioritize what I was hearing from the person and from people more than what I was being told by the drug reps or indeed sometimes by my medical teachers because I began to realize that the person walking in the door, the patient walking in the door has no agenda other than their welfare and well-being. So what they say to me in terms of what they're experiencing is quite trustworthy. One or two other myths now without spending too much time on this. Another one we're going to have to look at. If we're going to have any chance, I think, of solving this whole mental mental health crisis that Britain has and Ireland has and most, most so-called developed countries have. We're going to have to look again at suicide because one of the core beliefs in society, and it originates through the medical profession, is that suicide is very closely linked with the concept with mental illness. So very closely linked, for example, with depression. So suicide then is very frequently kind of, again, channeled into that medical world that it was a complication of the depression. And if the depression was better treated, for example, then it mightn't have happened. That is just not true. I, I, I do not see that as true. Again, there's it's a belief that has been pushed and the public have taken it because it's, they're, they're told it by doctors who are very trustworthy generally. But, you know, I've looked very closely at suicide and suicide is about pain and suffering and losing hope and losing any sense that there's anything I can do or anyone else can do to make it better. And I think we're really going to have to relook at these things. And I think in relooking at them, James, we cannot be guided by the medical profession solely on this because, as I said, the medical profession are invested. They're heavily invested in channeling the whole emotional and mental health world into the medical profession. But I have very little doubt now that suicide has so much to do with life, with pain, suffering, loss, wounding, trauma. Trauma is a key word in all of this, and you don't hear that word used much within the mental health system. Dr. Lynch, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is a key diagnosis tool for psychiatrists. Many people are under the impression that the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, or the DSM, is a scientific document and therefore fully reliable. It is not scientific at all. The DSM is constructed by the American Psychiatric Association, who meet from time to time to construct and create the DSM. And it's basically a consensus document. After a lot of arguing and toing and froing, they come up with the consensus that is called the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And I'm not being facetious when I say that there are many similarities between the construction of the DSM and the election of the Pope. The Pope is elected by getting cardinals together into a conclave away from the public and they they work it through and they consider candidates and one by one they wean them out until they agree. And then the white smoke comes up from the Vatican. And with the DSM, it's a very similar process. Groups of psychiatrists have got together, they meet, they talk, and bit by bit they just hammer it down until they finally agree. And why that's relevant is that, again, this points to the faith-based basis of the DSM. It's a consensus faith-based ideology in which science plays virtually no part in the construction of. 
Thank you. And are there any other common myths or falsehoods that we should be aware of? Actually, one other myth. The myth that the whole mental health medical approach coming from psychiatry is scientifically based. That is a real myth. It's not scientifically based. It is faith-based. And we've just given some examples of that. Doctors believe in chemical imbalances. And note the word believe. Doctors tell their patients about chemical imbalances. But they're never proven. Now, science is all about proving. It's all about establishing what we think might be the case. So, you know, whether it's depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and I'm not for one second saying these aren't issues or problems. They most certainly are. Experiences and behaviors are very real, very painful. They cause a lot of problems for the person themselves. There's often a ripple effect and knock-on effect on people around that person and losses to society, etc. But we're not going to solve them, in my opinion, by continuing this delusional idea of channeling it all into the world of the medical profession. Psychiatry is not scientifically based, it's faith-based, precisely the opposite of science. And Dr. Lynch, can I ask you, if we could change one single thing to try and improve the way we treat mental health, what is the one change that would have the most impact? The change I'd most like to see is the change at the very first point, because I think everything follows from that. Mm. And what I mean by that is, when people present, whether it's a doctor, usually to a doctor, the doctor's looking for what's wrong and trying to diagnose what's wrong. That is not the right way to go about this. We need to be looking at what's right. In other words, what's right about the person feeling this at this time in their life? What's right about this person having these experiences at this time in their life? How can we make sense of it within normal English discourse without resorting to medical language that really doesn't apply here? So I think the validation of experience, the idea that all experience is purposeful, all feelings make sense. So to not censor at the at the kickoff, you know, when people go to the doctor and they say, I'm feeling this and I'm feeling that, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing that. And then quite quickly, quite often, you know, 63 million times in England last year, I think, you know, doctors decide, oh, well, you're depressed and that's your problem. And I think we need to bring it back. We need to bring it back from the depression idea to the actual core issues. So people will often go to a doctor because they're overwhelmed. And then that gets converted into the idea of depression. It's the overwhelm that needs attention. So that would be what I, one of the things I'd really like to see. I would also like to see a, a much richer approach to this distress, that rather than very quickly, within a few minutes, converting people's or repackaging people's experiences into what is called depression, that we would realize as a society and the people working with people going through this distress would realize that actually what's going on, because I, I, I see this every day, is that people are experiencing wounding, shock, distress in many forms, defense mechanisms and coping strategies. These are big parts of what become called depression. Uh, choices and choice making, how we need to look at that and see how wounding and trauma affects our choice making. And then trauma, which of course infuses all of what I've just said there. This is what's actually going on when people go to the doctor and they end up diagnosed with depression. So we get it wrong at the first step. And then it's not surprising to me that if we get it wrong at the first hurdle, that that just, the ripple effect continues on and on and on. I agree. And again, I only fairly recently came to realise that my diagnosis of depression was a negative thing. I thought that a diagnosis would help me get treatment that I needed, but instead it disempowered me and led to a well-worn treatment pathway of medication without any conversation about alternatives. That's right. And and for, for many doctors, and I've seen this many times, many, many family members have said this to me. It's kind of like the medical profession is happy with that, that that's often enough as far as the doctors are concerned. But one of the things that often strikes me is that we doctors need to remember that people have lives and people have relationships and people have hopes and dreams. And what's happening to all of those? In, in my opinion, that the person's life and what's going on and what's not working and what's working need to be core and central to the work. Whereas what often happens is it, the focus goes on the medication and are you taking your medication and we'll up the dose, we'll down the dose, we'll add another drug. And the person's life, which is the core of their existence, isn't, isn't, doesn't really come into the equation. I'm not suggesting for one second that anybody listening to this podcast should suddenly stop their medication or if you've had good experiences medication. Of course, I, I completely recognize that. Or do not see this podcast as personally encouraging you or anyone else to make changes in your medication because you do need support and good advice around that. Thank you. That is a very important message to reinforce for listeners. 
I wanted to ask Dr. Lynch, on your website, you offer a wide range of support for people with depression, and it struck me that this information has clearly been created over many years. I just wondered if you could tell us a bit more about how you view depression and what kind of support you make available. Well, as I alluded to earlier on, James, depression is not a term I particularly like because I don't think it's accurate. I prefer to break it down to the constituents, to whatever it is people are actually experiencing, and then work with that. So that's how I tend to view and work with depression. So What I do really is I I work with whatever is going on for the person. As I said, it's usually a combination of woundedness, distress, shock, defense mechanisms or or, um, coping strategies. And all of these can can be rich areas to work with within the person. You know, if somebody's had a lot of wounding, James, it's not surprising that they will seek to defend themselves or protect themselves. And many of the aspects of what is called depression are actually those type of defense mechanisms, like shutdown and cutting off and disconnecting. And I find it much more helpful to see them as understandable reactions to life and how life has evolved for that person and to work with that rather than say, oh, well, that's part of depression and here's your prescription. That doesn't really open up the doors that recognizing what these experiences truly are opens. So what I'm doing now in terms of the courses, James, I've realized, I think, that I I have come to a pretty deep and rich understanding of the psychiatric diagnoses. And I think this is another problem with the psychiatric diagnoses. Because they have become so medicalized, the view of them that tends to dominate out there in the world is the medical view. And what I've learned is that the emotional and psychological aspects of depression, of bipolar, schizophrenia, they are core to the whole experience. So what I'm seeking to do is to provide us a forum to educate people on what these things really are and to provide ideas in terms of what people can do for themselves to help therapists connect in with the psychiatric diagnoses because the medicalization of these experiences has also, in a way, cut many areas of therapy off from, say, the particularly the bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, etc., because they're so seen as medical problems. And that really needs to be revisited very seriously. Well, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you because your initial course on understanding some of this is free and I really do recommend that listeners sign up for it at www.drterrylynch.com because there are very few resources of this kind out there that are easy for people to access. Just one thing that I, I could like to say, James, we were talking previously before this interview about you know, how have we found ourselves in this position of medicalizing distress where now in, there are more than 60 million antidepressant prescriptions written in a year. How do we get to that point and what change do we need to, to make? You know, that is that is a catastrophic situation, in my opinion. But it was completely predictable because this is what happens when you give a group, in this case, the medical profession, virtual total uh, responsibility and ownership of an area of life. And to me, this just is more evidence that the medical profession and their approach is not solving this problem. And I don't believe they can solve it because they... I don't believe they have the understanding, the emotional, psychological understanding required to really address what's going on. So I I see this as a disastrous but an inevitable consequence of the channeling of human distress into the medical profession. What what would we expect if if we as a society decide that doctors, medical doctors, are the ones to deal with this, then we really shouldn't be surprised if 63 million antidepressant prescriptions are written in a year because you you get what you pay for and it's an alarm bell we're looking at this the wrong way 63 million antidepressants prescribed in a single year is a frightening figure isn't it it's actually more than the number of inhabitants in the uk so clearly there's polypharmacy going on and people are taking multiple antidepressants at once yes there are And, and, and many of these people are not having their fundamental problems and pain and distress addressed even even noticed, and that's why I wrote these courses, so that people would realize that there's this whole world of emotionality and psychology that is within the person, but it's not really been picked up within the system. It's being missed. The radar is not set to pick it up. I've said this before, but I cannot emphasize this too much. We need to revisit the situation where we give the medical profession the ultimate authority and power. So we need a reassessment, a reframing of emotional and psychological distress. But what we must not do as a society is allow the leaders of the current system to have a veto or a deciding vote on where that goes. There must be equality and that must extend to the whole area of expertise in in mental health needs to be revisited because it isn't what it is said to be. Thank you. I think that's a powerful summary of why we are where we are. 
Dr Lynch, do you have any general advice for someone who's considering taking an antidepressant? I think the most important thing, James, when you take an antidepressant is really inform yourself. And I think the doctor will tell you a certain amount, but it is quite likely, given my experience over many, many years, that you know, you'll get one side of it possibly from, from the doctor. I think make your own inquiries. Uh, go online and check about the adverse effects of these, plus the benefits. You know, I prescribe drugs, James. I, I prescribe. I'm not completely anti-drugs. I just think that they're they're grossly overused because, as Abraham Maslow said, I think, you know, to a man with, with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And I think that's the system we have. It's so drug-focused that both doctors and the public think of drugs as, as the option. So I would say inform yourself and you take charge of your well-being. You know, you take charge of it. Don't give your don't give the ultimate power over your health and well-being to anyone else. That's great. Thank you so much. I just wondered, was there anything else that you would like to tell the listeners? No, I don't think so, James. I would like to just say to you that what you're doing is really good. And uh, I think you're, you're channeling your own experiences in, in a very positive way here. So I applaud what you're doing. And I hope that your podcasts receive the public attention that they deserve. Well, thank you, Dr. Lynch. You really will help that to happen. And I'm really grateful to you for being a part of this project. You've described the limitations of modern psychiatry with such eloquence and clarity. And I just wish that more psychiatrists would take notice of their peers in this regard. We need more like you. So thank you for standing up. I, see, I, I, had, to, I had to step out of the, uh, the brotherhood, really. And um, very few people are prepared to do that. It can't be an easy place to be when going against the mainstream because it's easy for them to dismiss anything they don't agree with. I mean, I remember thinking way back when I was making these decisions, I literally walked away from a practice. I gave my patients four months notice. I said to myself, I won't, I can't do this anymore. I won't do it anymore. I want to find something more meaningful, more real, more honest in terms of mental health. But a question I asked myself, I was doing a lot of personal reflection at the time, and I asked myself a question, because I had read this and I thought it was a really important point. I said to myself, someday I'm going to be on my deathbed, and I'm going to look back on my life, and I'm going to have to ask myself a really serious question, and that is, did I live well? Did I live rightly? Did I live honestly? And once I asked myself that question, that made it much easier. Because I can sleep well at night, I don't have to worry about things I haven't done or said that maybe I should have, but I didn't because I was afraid of sticking my head above the parapet or, you know. So so from a spiritual perspective, even, James, it's been fabulous. And the people I've met, you know, really good people like you, has been worth it, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk with me. I'm so grateful to Dr. Lynch for being part of this podcast, and I hope you found the interview as engaging and enlightening as I did. Feedback. Feedback. Thank you so much for getting in touch and sharing your thoughts with me. I'd like to read out some comments and feedback from you. Firstly, there's been a lot of feedback praising Daryl, who we heard from in the last episode. People particularly wanted Daryl to know how brave they felt he was for coming forward to share his experiences, and especially for talking about PSSD, post-SSRI sexual dysfunction. Daryl's interview is honest, emotive, and shocking. One listener writes... Daryl was brilliant. To be treated like that at such a young age is truly shocking, and to go on and speak up for others is totally courageous. As I'm sure you can imagine, I struggled to keep my emotions under control while I was interviewing Daryl. His description of the lengths that psychiatry will go to to justify its approach was poignant and powerful. If you haven't yet listened to episode 5, I recommend that you hear Daryl's experiences for yourself. I've also heard from a listener in Canada who says... I wanted to write to thank you for your podcast. It was very nice to listen to your first few episodes as I was looking for some support in the process of tapering off my medication. Withdrawal can often be scary, especially since the effects often look like exacerbated anxiety or depressive symptoms. Hearing that other people experience similar things makes me feel less crazy and more angry that our healthcare system and our society care so little for one another. Well, thank you so much for getting in touch. And these and other comments are typical of the excellent discussions that are going on in the Facebook group that supports this podcast. If you wanted to join in, go to Facebook and search for Let's Talk Withdrawal. You'd be very welcome to join in. Finally, if you're struggling with withdrawal yourself and don't know where to turn, there are some excellent resources listed on my website, jfmore.co.uk. Please go and have a look. Please do not increase, decrease or stop your psychoactive prescription medication without the advice and support of a medical or mental health professional. Thank you so much for listening. I can't wait to share the next episode with you, so please come back next week to listen in. Until next time, take care.
Thank you so much for listening to Let's Talk Withdrawal. Come back next week for more news and views. If you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review and subscribe in iTunes.